Live NFL trivia every Tuesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge and have a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. When a team makes a pick in the first round of the NFL Draft, tons of people chime in on it, as is to be expected. You got fans loving or hating the pick. You got media members loving or hating the pick. You got the draft experts loving or hating the pick. Basically, everyone's gonna have an opinion. And while people have been laughably wrong before, generally speaking, if you are a general manager, you don't want certain people scratching their heads. You don't want the owner or the coach or the other scouts in the room criticizing the pick. But perhaps most importantly, you don't want your own wife scratching her head wondering what the heck you were thinking. When your wife is frantically calling you after the pick questioning your logic, that's when you know you kinda screwed up. Especially when in the end, your wife was kind of right. At the 2002 NFL Draft, Les Snead, the director of pro player personnel for the Atlanta Falcons, helped make a pick that sent his wife into a frenzy. And this is the story behind that. Before I talk about the pick and what went down on draft day, we need some context as to how the Atlanta Falcons were looking. In 2001, the Falcons were not a good team. Yes, they improved from their 4-12 campaign one year before, but they still finished 2001 with a losing record and ended it on a really sour note. After starting off 6-4 and, and looking like a possible playoff team, they lost five of their final six games to end the year with a 7-9 record. Over those final six games, their defense allowed 186 points for an average of 31 per game. Obviously, that's terrible. If the Falcons were going to compete in 2002, they needed some help. Obviously, their quarterback position was fine, as they drafted Michael Vick first overall, but just about everything else needed help. Their leading receiver was Terrence Mathis, who would be 35 years old when 2002 rolled around. He only had 564 receiving yards in 2001. No Falcons wide receiver crossed the 600-yard mark. Their top three receivers that year were all going to be 33 or older in 2002. Their defense needed an overhaul as well, finishing 30th out of 31 teams in passing yards allowed, dead last in yards per pass attempt, 30th in yards per carry, and dead last in yards per drive allowed. And only two players on the team had more than two interceptions. Both of them, Ashley Ambrose and Ray Buchanan, were on the wrong side of 30, and we know how corners typically decline around that time. But besides quarterback, if there was any position that seemed absolutely fine and didn't need any help at all, it was running back. At the position, the Falcons had not one, but two incredibly viable options. First, he had Jamal Anderson. He was a year removed from a thousand yard season, and when he was healthy, was one of the best backs in all of football. During the 1998 season, he had the best campaign by any running back in the league that year not named Terrell Davis, when he rushed for 1,846 yards and 14 touchdowns, touching the ball an incredible 437 times. He was an instrumental part of why the Falcons made it to Super Bowl 33, and you can learn more about that game by clicking the card in the upper right corner. However, he was coming off of his second torn ACL in three years, missing almost all of the 1999 and 2001 seasons. When healthy, he was as good as anyone, but that was proving somewhat troublesome. That's why the Falcons made a big splash in free agency by acquiring former Buccaneers running back Warwick Dunn. The team gave him a six-year deal worth $20.5 million, making it clear that he was going to get 20 touches a game. Dunn was a former first-round pick who made two Pro Bowls in Tampa, and was named the Offensive Rookie of the Year back in 1997. The Falcons had a ton of holes, but with Dunn and the possibility of a healthy Anderson, running back was definitely not one of them, at least not early on. Guess what they did with their first round pick? When the draft rolled around, the best case scenario for Atlanta, which had the 17th pick, was that they wound up with Tennessee wide receiver Dante Stallworth. He went to the Saints at 13, so the Falcons were torn between two players. Those guys were Hawaii wide receiver Ashley Lilly, and for some reason which will be explained later, Michigan State running back TJ Duckett. But the Falcons figured that this would be a moot point. The Cleveland Browns had the 16th pick one spot ahead, and they needed a running back badly. They only averaged 3.2 yards per carry. They had one of the worst rushing offenses in all of football, and their leading rusher was third round pick James Jackson, who averaged an abysmal 2.8 yards per carry. They would take Duckett, the Falcons would take Lee, and everything would be good. Except the Browns took Boston College running back William Green. When the 17th pick rolled around, Lee and Duckett were still on the board, and Atlanta would have been fine with either. The Oakland Raiders called, looking to move up one spot. Atlanta took the deal. They figured that the Raiders would get Lee, they'd still wind up with Duckett, and they get a free fifth round pick out of it in return. Except the Raiders took Miami quarterback Philip Buchanan, and Atlanta took this as a sign that they needed to take Duckett. 
And so, despite the fact that they clearly did not need a running back, they spent their first round pick on one. The Michigan State man was theirs. And that's when Les Snead, the man who helped make the pick, received a phone call. Normally on draft weekend, his wife would go to the beach and just leave him be. But when Ducky got drafted, she immediately called up his husband and said, A running back? What are you doing? The pick was being criticized by just about everyone. Heck, the New York Times called the pick a waste. And now Sneed's own wife was among the critics? Yeah, that's not good. Sneed defended the pick, saying that the team knew what they were doing. That Duckett was the team's fourth-ranked player on the board and they had to take him to sleep. That they didn't truly know about Jamal Anderson and needed some insurance. And that they could improve at wide receiver through free agency by signing a veteran. He said that taking Duckett was like someone on vacation getting bumped up to first class instead of coach. No, I don't know what exactly he meant by that. You come up with your own interpretation. But that raises the question. Who was right? Was it Sneed or was it his wife? Was this pick a waste? Turns out, it's a bit complicated. The Falcons had made a ton of questionable decisions in the draft. There was a time they traded a first round pick for Peerless Price, which didn't work out in the slightest bit. There was a time they traded away a future top five pick for a second round pick, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. And there was this moment right here. While Anderson never played again after that 2001 season, showing that the Falcons did in fact need another running back as an insurance option, Duckett was… well, again, it's complicated. Duckett only lasted four seasons with the Falcons. In those four seasons, the most rushing yards he ever had was 779 during the 2003 campaign. Other than that, he never had more than 510 yards in any season. Yes, he scored 31 touchdowns and did his job as a powerful change of pace back who could punch it in at the goal line and compliment work done nicely. But if you're a first round pick and you finish your stint with a team with just over 2,100 rushing yards, that's not very good. The work done signing in free agency was an excellent move for Atlanta, as he played all six years of that contract and had over 7,500 yards from scrimmage. He even made it to a Pro Bowl one year. Adding Duckett as insurance in that draft and using a first round pick on him? Not so much. In the 2006 offseason, the Falcons traded Duckett to Washington ending a somewhat disappointing four years there. That same day, in a full circle move, they made another trade and acquired Broncos wide receiver Ashley Lilly. What's the lesson of this story, if there is one? It usually takes three years to determine whether or not a draft class is going to be good or pan out. But if your wife is calling you telling you that the pick you made was not a good one, odds are she's probably going to be right. Be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jarrogator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.